Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 43, Solar System Exploration. I've talked throughout this podcast about the ebbs and flows of scientific rigor in science fiction over the years. From hard sci-fi in the golden age of the 40s and 50s, to soft sci-fi in the new wave of the 60s, back towards hard sci-fi in the 70s and eventually reaching an equilibrium where anything from Carl Sagan's Contact to George Lucas's Star Wars was fair game. But it would be wrong to say that the genre has stood still from there. New trends come in and out of fashion as both technology and culture advance. But it's true throughout the genre. One interesting trend started in the early 90s and is still going strong to this day. A renewed push for the hardest of hard sci-fi and the exploration of our own solar system. To be sure, the idea of exploring and colonizing the solar system has been around for a long time, going back at least to Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles in 1950. But there was a clear resurgence of these stories beginning with Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars in 1992, with a few precursors like Arthur C. Clarke's later Space Odyssey books. And in particular, these stories are typified by pushing hard sci-fi all the way to its limit, not postulating any new physics, not including any kind of exotic or impossible technology, not even making a lot of use of the more speculative technology we do have. You don't see a whole lot of use of carbon nanotubes, for example. Granted, this is often true of cyberpunk as well, but that genre tends to be more fantastical in terms of the social order it portrays. Stories of solar system exploration, unsurprisingly, focus more on the hard science and exploration parts. These are stories that are set 20 minutes into the future, things we could do today with sufficient funding and resources. Or else they show things as they could be later, even a couple hundred years in the future, if we don't discover any new physics or transformative technologies. I had to do some digging to discover that this form of science fiction actually has a name. It's called mundane science fiction, although many authors dispute that it should be considered a separate subgenre. The phrase was coined in 2004 by British sci-fi author Jeff Ryman and some anonymous colleagues in a document called The Mundane Manifesto, link in the description. Although Ryman later claimed it was a joke, it does jive with the kinds of stories I'm looking at here. The signers of the manifesto argued that science fiction needs to move away from escapism to near-future stories that are closer to the real world and can help inspire people to solve real-world problems and build a better future. Stated this way, mundane science fiction is something of a nebulous topic. Various authors have noted that it draws alternately on the hard sci-fi end of the spectrum of Golden Age stories, the social consciousness of the new wave, and the real-world, near-future focus of cyberpunk and post-cyberpunk. And properly speaking, it's a broader topic than solar system exploration alone, since it can also include earthbound stories like The Handmaid's Tale, Children of Men, and many episodes of Black Mirror. However, in this episode, I'm looking specifically at the trend of writing stories about realistic space exploration in the near future, something that's a little easier to define. I find it interesting that these kinds of stories became prominent in the 1990s rather than at the height of the space race. Of course, in the 60s, the view of future space exploration was pie-in-the-sky, Mars-by-1980 stuff, or even cruising the galaxy with warp drive. After the space race was over we became more realistic about it. It wasn't worth it for America to go past the moon, and it wasn't worth it for anyone else to challenge America for the moon, so we took our time with it. But it is true that in the 90s, and even the 80s, space exploration was expanding after more than a decade of contraction. The space shuttle first flew in 1981. The Soviet Mir space station, the first permanently inhabited space station, was launched in 1986. The Hubble Space Telescope in 1990 and serious plans were in the works for what became the International Space Station, launched beginning in 1998. So, space was becoming a bigger deal at this time. On the other hand, perhaps part of the appeal of space exploration stories was that the kids who were inspired by watching the moon landings 20 years earlier were now grown up and writing books and buying books for themselves. It's probably not a coincidence that the Apollo 13 film came out in 1995. Either way, one of the books that consistently makes the shortlist for major works of mundane science fiction is Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson. 
Kim Stanley Robinson studied English in school, receiving a PhD from UC San Diego in 1982, but he was no stranger to science fiction, as he wrote his dissertation on Philip K. Dick, on the recommendation of his advisor. I don't know if he was inspired by the moon landings, although he was 17 when they happened, so he may have been. He was inspired by other developments in space exploration. His first novel, Ice Henge, was set on several planets in the solar system, including Mars. He began writing it in Ursula K. Le Guin's writing workshop in 1977, but the middle section, set around Saturn, was inspired by the photos of Saturn sent back by the Voyager spacecraft in 1980. And in perhaps a more unusual case, he has said that the entire Mars trilogy grew from the seed of a single idea. He was looking at satellite photos of Mars and thought that they looked like a good place to go backpacking, somewhere like the Sierra Nevadas or the Grand Canyon. That one thought led him to create a vision of Mars as a place where people could live in the future. The Mars trilogy consists of Red Mars, Green Mars, and Blue Mars. Predictably, it tells the story of humans colonizing and terraforming Mars, from the voyage of the first colony ship with only 100 colonists to two centuries later, when Mars has become fully habitable and independent. Notably, unlike many stories of this type that cover long stretches of time, several key characters stay the same the whole way through the series, thanks to new life-extending medical science. To be honest, I only read Red Mars, though. While it was technically well done, I wasn't that impressed with it. It didn't leave me itching to read the sequel. However, it is true that Robinson crafted an epic story that dives deep into themes of environment and ecology, as well as economics and society. The Martian society has to decide how it will structure and govern itself as it deals with rapid growth, a radically changing environment, and intense immigration from a resource-starved Earth. Meanwhile, one of the largest divides among the colonists is between the Greens and the Reds. The Greens are people who want to terraform Mars, while the Reds want to preserve Mars in its natural state, even ascribing a certain spiritual value to it. Despite all the arguments and even violence caused by the conflict, Robinson ultimately tells a utopian tale about how people can build a new society. It's a long, hard road, and there are setbacks and revolutions, both successful and failed, but they eventually make it work, leading Mars into a golden age. However, I do have to mention one thing that really annoyed me in the book. In the first baby steps of terraforming, the colonists drop a bunch of small, lightweight windmills all over the planet. Each windmill powers a heater to warm up the area around it, warming up the whole planet just slightly. It's a tiny amount, and the characters themselves acknowledge that it's really a symbolic gesture. But the problem is that the net heat produced is zero. Second law of thermodynamics, all of the wind energy eventually decays to heat anyway. The windmills don't actually do anything. Robinson has admitted that he added some of his own innovations to the terraforming process, some of which were liked by scientists and some of which have since been shot down. I've linked an interview with Robinson in the description in which he discusses the Mars trilogy in greater depth. In more recent years, Robinson has become better known for his environmental-themed novels set more heavily on Earth, like 2312 and New York 2140. However, he continues to write books about space exploration, such as Aurora, about a generation ship traveling to Tau Ceti, and Red Moon, about Chinese dissidents organizing in lunar colonies. A revolution on the moon seems to be a popular trope in sci-fi. But Kim Stanley Robinson is not the only author in the game. Far from it. Another author who wrote a lot of these kinds of stories was Ben Bova, with his Grand Tour series about the colonization of the solar system. Ben Bova was an extremely prolific writer, with more than a hundred novels to his name, including 26 in the Grand Tour series. He began writing the series in 1992 with a novel titled simply Mars, about the first crewed mission to Mars. Among the Grand Tour books, there is one named for every planet in the solar system. The last book in the series is Neptune, published last year in 2021. There's some indication that Bova was intending to do Pluto as well, but he unfortunately died before he could write it, and I can't find any official word on it. Bova's most famous novel is Titan, published in 2001 and winner of the John W. Campbell Memorial Award in 2007. Titan, naturally, is about the first colonization effort in the Saturn system, 
and the struggles the colonists have in keeping things going. The Grand Tour may not be as widely read, but it's some impressive work. In fact, as an aside, when I first started writing science fiction on my own, my original plan was to get into this branch of the genre. But I realized my plan was essentially what Ben Bova already did 20 years earlier, so I started looking further afield. For a more recent example, I mentioned Mary Robinette Kowal's Lady Astronaut series in episode 36 about alternate history. Those are technically set in the past, but they get an honorable mention for a detailed and realistic depiction of how we could have colonized the moon in the 50s and Mars in the 60s if disasters on Earth had forced us to. Another popular recent series is The Expanse by James S. A. Corey, which is in fact the pen name of a duo of authors, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. The Expanse consists of nine books and has been adapted into a TV series on the Sci-Fi Channel and later on Amazon Prime. This is a bit of a weaker case of the trope. It's set the farthest in the future of any of these examples, at some vaguely defined time in the 2300s. And it also strays the furthest from hard sci-fi, with alien technology, wormhole travel, and whatever that proto-molecule thing was supposed to be. On the other hand, it does have a lot of mundane focus, with power games at the UN, exploitation of colonists in the asteroid belt, and Mormons traveling to another system in a generation ship. Okay, that one's a little off the wall. But most importantly, all of the technology used by humans is pretty hard sci-fi, so I think it fits. But the most famous novel in this category is almost certainly The Martian by Andy Weir. Weir, a computer programmer by trade, originally wrote The Martian as a web serial in 2011, after failing to find an agent for it but it became popular enough that he was eventually able to get it traditionally published in 2014. You probably know the story. Astronaut Mark Watney, on the third crewed mission to Mars, is lost in an accident and presumed dead. But he in fact survives and, finding himself stranded alone on the Red Planet, takes it upon himself to grow his own food, communicate with Earth, and eventually help with a seat-of-the-pants attempt to bring him home. While Weir makes a few errors in the book, the most notable being that the initial dust storm that caused the accident wouldn't happen like that. Martian winds are not that strong. He put some really good science in the book. And he certainly captures the spirit of NASA at its best. Even where there are disagreements, everyone is working toward the same goal and genuinely trying their best to achieve it. It's a different tone from a lot of these stories. And it's the sort of optimistic story the genre needs these days. Weir's second book, Artemis, was not quite as well received in part because it was so different from The Martian. It's more of a low-key heist story set in a lunar colony in the 2080s. But I actually liked it quite a bit. It's just as well-researched as The Martian. We are clearly put a lot of thought into how a lunar colony would work technologically and socially. And he also drew clear inspiration from Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which is a definite plus. All in all, it's a pretty fun read. And of course, Weir's third book, Project Hail Mary, was released to great fanfare last year. However, that one is more hard sci-fi in the Larry Niven sense, postulating quite a lot of exotic new science, but then applying it as rigorously as possible. The other place where near-future space exploration has often come up recently is in film, where there has been a slow but steady string of examples. Of course, I already mentioned Apollo 13. I'd even include Deep Impact, which, although it's really a disaster movie, featured a space mission that got the science mostly right. Then there were less famous ones like Space Cowboys, which did a decent job. The highly acclaimed Moon in 2009 is softer sci-fi with its premise of clones being used as cheap labor by unethical corporations, but the backdrop of mining helium on the Moon is a pretty solid one. Then, in the 2010s, there were three pretty notable movies about near-future space exploration. Gravity, Interstellar, and Ad Astra. Of the three, gravity got the science mostly right. The biggest error being that the orbits of satellites and space stations are not that close together. Gravity is a very tightly shot thriller in which a satellite collision creates debris that destroys the space shuttle and International Space Station, leaving Sandra Bullock and George Clooney stranded in orbit and struggling to get home. In fact, satellite debris is a very real threat in space, but it's over periods of years, not a two-hour film. Still, the physics of orbital collisions just shredding everything in their path was hauntingly accurate. Oh, and no sound in space, of course. That part's vital. On the other hand, Interstellar, 
despite all of the effort they put into making the black hole look realistic, got the science mostly wrong. Seriously, there are too many mistakes to get into here, not to mention human error, like why would you even consider a planet that was under such severe time dilation when it wasn't even your best candidate? Okay, not getting into that rant now. Meanwhile, 2019's Ad Astra honestly was not all that good, but it did get the science mostly right. Well, to be clear, the quote-unquote power surges frying electronics on Earth all the way from Neptune was ridiculous six ways to Sunday. And the moon pirates were a little weird. But the rest of it, depicting nascent colonies on the moon and Mars in the late 21st century, was pretty good. There are hits and misses among these examples. Still, I feel about this overall trend in sci-fi a lot like I did about the calculating stars. I think this is the science fiction we need in the 21st century. Optimistic and forward-looking, yet also realistic and attainable. Inspired by real-life events, and, if we're very lucky, inspiring future progress in space as well. I don't know where it's going, but I hope that with the continued advance of SpaceX and its rivals, and NASA's new moon ambitions, we will continue to see new stories of exploring the solar system in the future. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is hosted by Libsyn and is available on all the major platforms. I'm on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, where I just released my first Exoplanets review video, which I hope to turn into a monthly series in which I talk about the latest developments in exoplanet science. So if you want to know what's up with exoplanets, check that one out. I'm also on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction and my own website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode is The Martian by Andy Weir. It's a fun, death-defying, yet upbeat adventure that showcases the best of what space exploration could be. If you haven't gotten around to reading it, perhaps if you've only seen the movie, check it out. We're getting pretty near to the present in this podcast now, but there's one more development in sci-fi from the 90s that we need to discuss. In the next episode, we explore the renaissance in children's sci-fi. Thanks for listening.